Now we're going to join together in exploring God's Word during the sermon. Today is the conclusion of our post-Easter series. We've titled it, Wake Up, How Easter Moves Us. We think about the image in Scripture of believers, when they die, they're asleep because they will wake up one day to a glorious eternity. But also God's Word is waking us up to think about what it means to live under God's grace in this world right now. And so we have worked our way from the first verse to the last verse of the great resurrection chapter of the Bible, 1 Corinthians 15. We'll be looking at that final section today, which was our epistle lesson. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we declare you to be a beautiful Savior because of the beautiful thing that you have done for us sacrificing yourself, giving yourself for us out of your great love. And not just stopping there, but also rising again to new life, the gift of life that you give to each of us by faith. We pray, Lord, that that faith would grow during this time of study and that you would draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Some words to think about this morning. Life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you react to it. Those sound like wise words, practical words that a mother might say to her children to equip them for life. In fact, those words are from the writings of Christian author Chuck Swindoll. Life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you react to it. I really love that statement because it says that so much of life is about our attitude, how we handle situations. We can either handle them well or handle them poorly. In so many instances, it's really out of your hands what happens to you. You can't control other people's actions or attitudes You can't control decisions made by government leaders or larger movements within society. There are just a lot of things that are out of your hands that happen to you. And that's just a small fraction of life. The rest of life is how you respond to those things, what direction you take it. And really, there are two options for how we respond to the things that happen to us in life. One is a victim mentality in which our circumstances have power over us, and the other is a victor mentality, in which we stand over our circumstances. And those are two very opposite ways of handling things. That's part of that 90% of how we respond to life. A victim mentality, you've probably heard some things about that, it's really characterized by negative and faulty thought patterns such as, bad things always happen to me. Or, other people, circumstances are to blame for my problems. Or, I can't change, so why even bother trying? That's a victim mentality. That's a defeatist mentality. I'm stuck where I am. There's nothing I can do about it. And then the opposite would be the victor mentality, the mentality that stands above our circumstances and doesn't let them get the best of us. That kind of mentality says, yes, bad things happen in life, but I won't be overcome by them. And I do have some measure of personal power. I accept responsibility for my actions, for my choices. And with God's help, I can change. I can work on the things where I need to improve. So two very opposite mindsets. Now, I might ask you, which of those mindsets do you think that God wants for us? But that's very obvious, and Scripture reinforces it with these words from our text, from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Clearly, we are a people of the victory, and that's true for us because of our crucified and risen Savior. The victory is given to us. We walk in that. And our faith in Christ allows us to stand as victors, even in the face of bad things, even in the face of the worst thing of all, that 
that thing of finality that we call death. Now, death is the ultimate bad thing because, well, it's the end. At least it's the end for life on this earth. Now, we know as Christians that for our own death, well, after that, we're entering into a glorious eternity with the Lord. So for us, it's good. But the death of others is such a terrible blow to face in life, those losses. And so can that even be true? Can we stand as victors even over the big and difficult losses in our lives? This chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, it's really dealing with death and our approach to it. And that even in the face of death, we can stand as people of the victory. And you might be struggling with the realities of death yourself right now. Maybe you've lost someone close to you, and you feel lost without that person. Today's Mother's Day. It's a joyful day. It can also be a hard day if you've lost your mother and you are missing her. And so, as we hear these words of Scripture, they might sound like they're words that don't always fit. These words from our text, which declare victory, saying, O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? That's a victory chant, but we might look at that and say, we can stand above death? Because I feel it sting. If you've lost someone, and if you're in pain because of that, and if you're feeling lost without that person, you might say, well, I, I feel the sting of death. How can I claim victory over that? Because obviously it hurts, and it's painful, and so it feels very much like death has its sting. How does that claim of victory apply to even the deepest pains of life and the pain of loss? Well, to help with that conundrum, Let's look a little deeper at the context of our passage to see how we also can join in that victory chant saying, Oh, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? How do we get there when we're suffering with our own losses and own grief in our lives? Well, the context of the passage is this, that we're walking through this progression of Paul teaching about the resurrection, the final event that will happen when Christ comes again. This chapter began with Paul establishing the truth of Jesus' resurrection because Jesus showed himself alive to many people, many witnesses after his resurrection. And then the passage moved into a discussion about well, what if? What if Christ had not been raised? What would that mean? Teaching us that then the opposite is true. Because he has been raised, here's what it means. The passage talked about uh, Jesus' authority over all things, all things being in subjection to him. And then it talked about the resurrection body. What will that be like for those who have died to come back to life and to be transformed? And then today, the final section has to do with the person who is alive when Christ comes again. And the Scripture teaches us that at that time, uh, that person too will be transformed. So the dead will come back to life on the last day, transformed into a perfect state. So also those who are alive when Christ comes again will be transformed into a perfect state. And Paul uses words like these, saying, We shall not all sleep. That means we won't all die. We, the living, shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. And so it's going to happen for the dead and for the living at Christ's return, for all who have trusted in Him. And then after that, Paul gives an important element of the timing of all of that, saying, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying. Then shall come to pass the saying. At that time. And what is the saying? It's that victory chant. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? And the scripture says, at that time the saying will come true when Christ comes again. So we look ahead to that final day when Jesus vanquishes death once and for all, but we're not there yet. And so we still feel the sting because death is still a reality in our world. We're not there yet, and yet at the same time, we do join in that victory chant. 
Because we're told in Scripture that God has a gift for us, even in this moment. The verse is present tense in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, when it says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not only will he give us the victory when Christ comes again, but it says he gives the victory to us now. It's as if this future event, this great day of resurrection and renewal, is so big, it's so massive, it's so gigantic that the future cannot contain it, and it spills over into the present as well. The greatness of Christ's victory. God gives us now the victory in Christ. And so we are people of the victory, even today. The promised resurrection might lead us to modify the quote that I shared with you at the opening, that life is 10% what happens to you, it's 90% how you respond, and it's 100% how God responds. Because God has responded to the problem of sin and death in our world by sending His only Son, Jesus. Jesus, who was the victim, the true victim on the cross, and who was the true victor by walking out of the tomb on the third day. God has dealt decisively with the problem of sin and death, and He gives to us the victory, what is yet to come, the benefits of it. God appropriates Christ's victory to us right now in this life so that we walk as triumphant people, so that we embrace the scriptural truth that we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. The victory is yet to come, and yet it is also right now through faith in Jesus. And because of that, then God empowers us with a winning attitude in this life as we anticipate the disarming of death one day. We walk through this life as complete victors, and the Bible teaches us with the final verse of this great chapter. We've had 57 verses, and then the word therefore appears in verse 58, as in all of that is leading up to this crucial point, the last verse of 1 Corinthians 15. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. See, those are, those are not words of futility. Those are not words saying that what I do in this life is worthless and pointless. But it says it's all not in vain. It's all purposeful. God's purposes prevail in what you do and what I do when we are working for the Lord. And the passage, that verse, verse 58, began with these words, therefore my beloved brothers, but I think today it could begin with therefore my beloved mothers. Because who exemplifies these words more than mothers? The words that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Mothers pour themselves out for their children and for their families. And Christian mothers do even more because Christian mothers not only care for the needs of the body with food and with clothing and with all that they provide, they not only pro provide for the needs of the mind through teaching, imparting wisdom, getting their kids to school and back, but Christian mothers also care for the soul. They care for the soul through teaching Bible stories, through modeling the Christian life of worship and prayer. Christian mothers care for the soul through giving godly counsel to help their children navigate life. And Christian mothers also inspire victorious living in their children. Because it is Christian mothers who model by faith what it looks like to handle the adversities of life. From the small irritations and inconveniences to the great big problems like grief. Mothers teach what it is not to be a victim of circumstances, but to be a victor. Christian mothers teach about personal responsibility and owning our choices and our decisions. And Christian mothers teach about being able to change 
and with God's help to be the best that you can be. And Christian mothers teach about forgiveness and grace. And in all of these things, the saying is true, that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Now, Christian moms and dads, none of us teach these lessons perfectly because we're sinful, flawed people ourselves. But all Christian moms and dads carry out their parenting underneath that promise In the Lord, your labor is not in vain. And so those are great words for mothers to hear today. Those are great words for any of us to hear and embrace any day. In the Lord, your labor is not in vain, even if it feels like it. Even if you don't see the fruits of what you're doing, the Lord does. And that's what matters. Those are great words. Words to live by. They're words of victory. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, amen. And may the peace of God which passes understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.